explain it to us all then, Detective? No. I can peel back the layers, I can take it to a point, but what lies at the center? Glass Onion is a 2022 film written and directed by Ryan Johnson, but you already knew that. This is a piece of striking artistic effort and narrative majesty that truly has no equal, including its predecessors, which is also the point. Glass Onion dissects itself in full view in shockingly forward manner that I know some people found confusing. Jesus Christ, fellas. Thanks. We are invited to a sun-drenched Greece distinctly at the beginning of the pandemic, as if someone were writing a movie while experiencing a litany of psychological symptoms we all know by heart at this point. And it is in this moment we are told quickly that life for rich people is not the same as life for everyone else, during this very difficult May for many, myself included. Oh. Oh. Remember this moment, it's important. But what can be said of something that has boundless complexity painted with an assortment of brushes, but is infinitely transparent in its intentions? And don't get me started on this incredibly subversive message of, uh, I think money system not work so good right now. He whispered into the breeze as gently as possible. And yet you live in a society curious. So let's leave all that bullshit at the door. Here's a magic trick. I can exemplify this entire film in one simple historical explanation. I'm a video essayist. I can do that. Journey with me to a very specific moment in time that you almost definitely remember how you felt in that distinct moment. Come back with me to just before Halloween 2020, a Halloween that none of us got to celebrate. The loneliest Halloween. It is in this moment that Kim Kardashian tweets that she flew a bunch of her friends to Tahiti to celebrate her 40th birthday. How did that make you feel? The whole world, all of us, are stuck inside, swaddled in our grief from loved ones who fell for alarmingly effective and very dangerous disinformation. Yeah, okay, take all of that pain and write a really funny takedown of an absurd world right now. And while you're on the way there, blow another kiss to Dame Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie for me. Maybe we all need a little wake-up call. Okay, hold on to that anger right there. Embrace it. It's time to break an onion, y'all. Psst, the onion is wealth and it's quite fragile. You know, okay, let's go. This layer is going to pontificate lovingly on the culture of coordination and collaboration that Ryan Johnson cultivates in every film he makes. As with the previous Benoit Blanc film, Knives Out, I think there is no other place to start in our journey about a Blanc film than a person that has worked right next to Ryan on features since they were teenagers. DP Steve Yedlin, let's go! The last go around, I talked in moderate detail about the ludicrous math and algorithmic camera magic that Steve has worked on to replicate and mimic every lovingly imperfect facet of film that digital filmmaking generally fails to emulate. Gate weave, light halation, grain information. I made a video about this you can watch right there. This film absolutely invokes the feeling of 1973. The rich friend vacation, oops it's a murder party movie. And just like that we pivot to noir. There is a beauty to the Yedlin Johnson team up that feels like two people who have known each other and have been collaborators for the better part of their lives, hitting the sweet spot in a film career that doesn't come around all that often. 
Can you be a great person of extraordinary vision without also being an abusive piece of shit whose main contribution to society at large is shifting the power dynamic between the haves and the have-nots to one side? Psst, yeah, I'm talking about you, bud. A film of remarkable artifice, a phrase that makes sense all the way back to the Latin, and someone else I did not talk about in the last video that is a key collaborator in the whole Agatha party is Jenny Yig. Daniel sat down with Jenny and he said, I want to be Jacques Tati by way of Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief. The costume designer of both films, and as a complete surprise to me, she also designed the costumes for the first season of True Detective, which rules. Her work in Glass Onion is second to none. What is Catherine doing? Is she smelling herself? She is. <laughs> Jenny created all these odd facets of characterization in their clothing and style alone. Put this key art on a clue repackage right now and I will buy 15 copies. You know, we always say it starts with the script. And Ryan is so very descriptive and he gave you a sense of what he wanted this film to look like. And you immediately got the sense this was broader than the original. You know, there's a lot more for me to do, to tell. But let's talk about noir specifically. Noir is a cynical genre, a genre built on the crimes people already got away with. Noir is also about good prevailing in a cynical world, and also in a laws don't apply to me kind of way. Oh my god, is Die Hard noir? Oh shit, I broke my own brain. Batman, for example, I think is best when they lean into noir. There are no perfect answers in this disgusting situation, so we're all just doing what we can. Noir is about craft. There is no lazy noir. Here, let's compare it to Knives Out. Benoit almost breaks the law in this film. He goes right up to the edge and leaves the room knowing what is about to occur. I have to answer to the police, the courts, the system. There's nothing I can do. There was something he could do. He is a detective beholden to the rules of the world that govern him. He also knows what needs to happen. And as an artist, at the end of the day, it's about the craft of the art well beyond the surprise of who done it. Knives Out and Glass Onion are kinda who done what films. Okay, I'm getting in the weeds here. Uh, let's talk about the things that influence us. Hello, we're Mikey and Tara and we're Filmjoy together. Uh, we are here today uh, sponsoring our own video to plead with you because it is so hard to run a business on YouTube. For the last six months, it's been getting hard to make ends meet here on YouTube. If you like the content that we put out, please support the channel and our business and our health insurance. At the rate we're going, we're not sure how much longer we can continue to pursue Filmjoy as our full-time jobs. If you want the channel to continue, there are three very easy ways to support us. Number one... Patreon! Boom! We have three Patreon tiers and all three of them get you Discord access and the highest one gets your name in the movies of Mikey credits. Patrons also get access to our Nebula videos and a YouTube link of the Nebula cut without any ads in it. Discord access, monthly editing streams, and early access to all of our videos. We also, uh, and this is rare on YouTube, I guess, we run our own merchandise store. Uh, it's in our garage. We run our own store called catawampus.inc. I don't know why I said it like that. Our shirts are printed locally here in Dallas. Uh, sometimes we draw pictures or write in the boxes. Yeah! And the final way you can support us is on Nebula. I don't know why I said it like that. Nebula. If you sign up for Nebula using our link. It's go.nebula.tv slash filmjoy. If you sign up using the link go.nebula.tv slash filmjoy, part of that subscription goes directly to us. So we've been doing this for almost 10 years at this point. It's been so wonderful being able to spread joy and love on the internet for the last nine years. So even if we don't hit the 10, like I still feel good about what we did here. Anyway, 
on with the video. Okay, buckle up and get ready to go some places. The Last of Sheila is a 1973 film written by Stephen Sondheim, yes, that one, and Anthony Perkins, yes, that one. It was directed by Herbert Ross, who has also directed Steel Magnolias, My Blue Heaven, Footloose, and The Secret of My Success. The Last of Sheila was a movie I was completely unaware of, until Ryan mentioned it as a pretty major influence on Glass Onion. The Last of Sheila is an incredibly underappreciated, amazing 70s whodunit written by Stephen Sondheim and Anthony Perkins, which is crazy. It's also a good frame to talk about the influence of The Last of Sheila on this movie. It's an incredible murder mystery. We take a real page from it in terms of the setup of this movie. Sheila is like a roadmap through Ryan's brain. I absolutely adored it as the slow burn corker that it is, though content warning, it is definitely 1973 in this movie, so people say some words that aren't splendiferous. Hey Charlie, give me a drone shot and some mysterious music, let's do this. The Last of Sheila is a film about a Hollywood producer, Clinton Green, whose wife, Sheila Green, was killed one year before the events of our film. Clinton Green, a piece of shit movie producer who everyone hates, throws a one year anniversary of Sheila's demise. The Sheila Green Memorial Gossip Game. It's a party game, but in France on a pleasure cruise on the yacht you own. Rich bitch. Yeah, see, you get it. Give me that drone shot again. To describe the entire plot of this movie would take 30 minutes and I would absolutely get demonetized. So, here's what Herbert Ross said about his own movie. It's not a picture about film people. It's about people. I'll tell you what this picture is about. It's about civilization and barbarism. You cannot make up for the absence of civilization. This is a movie about a rich person who tortures his friends for his own sick and twisted enjoyment. Hey, wait a minute. This is what fun looks like to a sociopath. Flaunt your impossible, non-replicable wealth in an effort to own your powerful, though not as powerful, friends. Both Glass Onion and The Last of Sheila are screenwriters having the most fun they've ever had writing the absolute worst people they know. In both instances, you give the audience some version of truth and then slowly distort that version of truth with more and more extremely important information to the grander picture. Benoit hangs out with the screenwriter of The Last of Sheila in this movie. He's just like, Hello, put me on with Murder, She Wrote in the Bathtub. Ring, 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 give me the front desk. Yes, hi, hello, this is satire. Get me the police. It's about the look on your face right now, if I may borrow a parlance from my favorite philosopher, Bosef Burnham. There it is again, that funny feeling. Art should hold a mirror up to our dumb asses. By the way, this entire essay ends with a reveal that I don't think everyone noticed in this movie, operating in plain sight. It was right there at the center of the onion the whole time. It changes the tone of the entire movie once you see it. Big claims, movie man. Well, slow your roll, because I still got five layers to go. I find the terms murder mystery and who done it are just woefully inept terms for a movie mystery writer who yearns for complex stories about wildly imperfect people. Agatha Christie, in her stories, was actively trying to subvert the tropes of her time. It's always been about doing the unexpected thing. Mystery stories are often mirrors of the world that birthed them echoes of ourselves and our own imperfections. If you're talking straight story narrative structure and the emotional turbines that stir it, mystery movies are often the most interesting to puzzle together, though I accept that this is a labor that not everyone loves to do. There's always a craft beyond the surprise. And luckily, this is my idea of a great time. And Ryan Johnson, my goodness, he is playing all kinds of games, kind of literally. You know, okay, let's just. <gasps> That's six times two! There's really no easy way to say this, so I'll just rip the band aid off. 
Benoit loudly decries in this film that he hates silly games, games such as Clue and Among Us. Cool. But here's the thing. In this film, he plays both games literally, and he's so damn good at them. He must be really great at Clue, huh? I'm very bad at dumb things. I'm Achilles' heel. Shh. Hold your tongue, baby bird. I'm calling shenanigans. Clue is the slightly easier one to illustrate because they fill out things that look shockingly like Clue game sheets. In this film, trying to discover the identity of the killer. Benoit plays Clue and finds out that trying to solve a crime based on process of elimination might not be the most realistic assumption. Alas, all of the guests both had motive and opportunity to do the crime. A thing that was also true in the first Benoit film. So, in the end, he's right about Clue, I guess? Still want that reprint, though. Hmm, Professor Gohord with the pineapple juice in the glass menagerie. I've solved it. A movie composed of false starts that are anything but. Ryan Johnson is the one playing the game. You are the one playing the game. Which upset a lot of people, so allow me to explain using the plot of this movie. Miles Braun, actual moron, runs a company called Alpha. He used to run it with Sandra Brand until Miles got in his thick little head he wanted to fully fund and own clear hydrofuel. Cut to two years ago, Miles meets some sketchy Norwegian scientists at an ayahuasca ceremony in Peru. No. Andy, Andy, come on. This is it. Because he has to gobble up everything he doesn't make himself, which is everything. You might be asking yourself, what does Alpha do? A tech company, a venture capital company, a car manufacturer? Sandra correctly believes that investing and staking this company was a terrible use of company resources and could not go through with it. So Miles, uh, killed her. And just to make everything clear here, Agatha Christie wasn't opposed to the secret twins trope. Hercule Poirot exercised it more than once. Bear with me, allow me to thread this needle back into games as the secret sister is used as an act of subterfuge or to look at it a different way. The secret twin trope is used so our two main characters can play a very literal game of Among Us. Boom! Landed it! Let's go! You didn't think it was coming back, but then it's like, wait! It's silly, Ryan's playing a game, whereas the artist's voice in the boisterous discourse of the modern billionaire era. Billionaire. Look, okay, wait, I want to talk about the Beatles. It's time to talk about the Beatles which will segue beautifully into a larger conversation about art in the day and age we live in. Fixing a hole in the ocean, trying to make a dovetail joint, yeah, looking through a glass onion. Those are the last three lyrics of the Beatles song, Glass Onion. Ooh, analysis. Also, you can't fix any hole, ocean, or otherwise with a dovetail jo- Am I going crazy? Okay, skipping to the important bit, the Beatles were fucking with you. This entire song is a reference to other songs and lyrics they wrote, lying in obfuscating meaning in hotly debated song lyrics. And at the time this song came out, this wasn't new for the Beatle Boys, as I am the walrus really means nothing at all. But it did not stop people from speculating who is the walrus. Ringo! Ringo has a sexy nose! It's complex, but transparent. I'll make it much more obvious. Uh, two of the three verses of the walrus ditty were written on acid. Just FYI. Though, on some level, John Lennon on acid was also trying to decipher Lewis Carroll's through the Looking Glass poem, The Walrus and the Carpenter. Something he, again on acid, believed represented both the capitalist elites and the working class, the haves and the have-nots. Art is lies in search of truths within ourselves, truths that are not the same for every person that interacts with it. Or here's a ridiculous way to look at the walrus and the carpenter. FTX somehow lost $9 billion of investor funds. Cuckoo, ka-choo. We all live in the glass onion. 
Hey, literal midnight update uh, from Michael here. Banks are collapsing too fast for me to update the script. We all in some way or another live in the glass onion watching Miles Braun pick the bones of culture clean for his own twisted power fantasy. Trust me, we're getting there. Miles, and by proxy all false idol billionaires, has absolutely no respect for any artists, living or dead. The guitar Paul wrote it on. <laughs> I know, legit, right? Oh, my friend, my friend. Which brings us to the greatest chapter title of all time. We live in an age of fraud. We live in an age of grift culture, where people can stockpile resources beyond their utility as a human being. Art is dead because it won't survive us. Whoa. Hold on. With this movie, a lot of people wanted to compare Miles Braun to Elon Musk, especially considering when this movie came out in theaters. It was peak Elon Musk wastes $44 billion on a thing he didn't even want. For sure, there are similarities, but it's a character that has echoes of many famously short-sighted tech bros. Miles Braun is as much Mark Zuckerberg as he is Elon Musk. This is not really a one-person issue in our current economical climate. Which brings us to Sam Bankman Freed. Bring back the drone shot. We're going true crime again. Sam Bankman Freed, or Sabuf as he liked to be called, was born on the campus of Stanford University. That's not a joke, both of his parents were professors there. The silver spoon never left his goddamn mouth. We can't parody reality fast enough for reality to graciously whisper into the breeze. The thing that I'm most excited for, and this is the first time I've ever said anything about this, for the last six months, I've been working on my own NFT project that uh, I believe is gonna change the game. Here's a take, and I want to make a mathematical argument here. Absurdist humor can really no longer keep up with reality. Miles Braun does not respect, appreciate, or even really see art. He sees a price tag, a means to inform others of his audacious wealth. And he would be the fifth worst billionaire in the world right now, C tier at best. Here's a wild hypothetical. How much would you say the Mona Lisa is worth? Techniques so advanced and studied that no one in the history of the world with any technology has come close to replicating. It's a target so big, a self-owned so spectacular, that it is just about the only thing that can bring down a billionaire, destroying the most important piece of art humankind has ever willed into existence. Did I get all that right? And to answer my own question, given that no painting on Earth is worth more than a few hundred million dollars, so correct my math here, on a painting the Louvre would never ever sell, at most it's worth a billion dollars. Would you hang a framed print of the Mona Lisa front and center? It's like having a Che poster in your dorm room. So being as generous as possible in a scenario where a billionaire accidentally destroyed the most famous and priceless work of art in the free world, it would only be 11% of the financial damage that SBF just did. Rimshot. Tip your servers, everybody. Yes, I just used uh, Glass Onion to illustrate quite practically the damage some of these dipshits are doing to the fabric of reality. This is real life. We live in a wake of upheaval the world hasn't seen in a minute. Ignore the cracks in the ceiling. Keep making content. Everything is fine. Keep making content. Wake up, Wake up Neo. Neo. It's a dangerous thing to mistake speaking without thought for speaking the truth. I'm gonna cut through the noise. Glass Onion is a fantastic murder mystery that broadens your understanding of the world it's painting as the actors nail six pieces of ham to the wall. It's glorious. 
It's Clue. I have to admit, Glass Onion makes more sense to me months after it came out because this movie saw through the crystal ball and pointed their bat at centerfield just as an asteroid slammed into it. History is rewritten every second of every day. We have flooded the world with so much content that practically nothing means anything anymore. This movie dug into my skull. How did we get here? We open in May 2020. You know, just to put you right back there and get you nice and immediately off kilter. Our guests received their outlandish invitations to the party and just to point it out, this movie shows you where the center of the onion is right there. And real quick, I think it's cool these movies just want to stand on their own. It's simply Glass Onion, a cool movie for cool people that just happens to star Benoit Blanc. Smash cut to Grease. Remember this moment? Ethan Hawke sprays the miracle mist down the character's throat like an American Horror Story villain. This will only be momentarily uncomfortable. Whoa. Oh. Open, please. Bravissimo. I find the way this film is structured intoxicating. Context slowly being added to the pot as actors do everything at 11 in the background 100% of the time. You can watch this movie a lot. Totes replayable, boys. A visual splendor that truly is the last of the last of Sheila. This movie recontextualizes itself so many times and then ends with a punctuation mark of apocalyptic denouement. It's a lot. This was people at the top of their craft holding a mirror in the exact moment the Emperor had no clothes on. This film will age like wine. A movie that has fun. Remember fun uh, before every movie universe required an updated spreadsheet of who the hell is on what show now? You watch a Benoit Blanc film, it will tell you a complete fun mystery story shot with precision and excellence and every actor actually wants to be there, which in this day and age is pretty rare. A film series that cuts through the noise. We live in the glass onion and we're just waiting for it to break. Oh, you've come for analysis, have you? We'll have a seat. We are witnessing the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We have reached the center of the Onion. Alpha is a company built on the miracle design of a genius that Miles worm-tongued onto before stealing everything Sandra had ever built. Or so we're told. It was her brilliant idea and it was worth killing her over. She trusted Miles and believed him to be harmless. And he poisoned her. But what if there was something else in plain sight? What if I spent way too long analyzing the napkin from this movie to discern the question I'd been asking myself all along? What does Alpha do? Well, I have an answer. Bring on the napkin. Enhance. Right at the center here, we have the directive free app. Okay, cool, nice to have a target, a free app, cool, that's a plan. Uh, then there's something about code delivery, uh, machine learning is all I, okay, that's just words. You're just saying words. We travel down the left side of the napkin labeled tracking. Ooh, they'll track your cryptocurrency. End of list, moving on. This will lead to exponential growth, uh, which will lead to worldwide excess about, okay, you, you guys maybe should, uh, and then the word diversification. Well, shut up because this all ties into our big earner, crypto scalability. Oh, hang on to the edge of your seat because we're not done. If you go down the other path of the napkin, you run into our real game changers, like uh, timestamps, a thing all source controlled code has, but go off, King. The f <laughs> The funniest one on the napkin is dark web efficacy, which I guess, uh, yikes, or whatever. The dark web is famously huge on people loudly bragging on their shit. Uh, and somehow, all of this will lead right 
to manpower, and then there's the drawing of little dudes. Okay, that's a business plan. Boom. Give me the money. It's 100% goobity poop. It is investor bait that would get laughed out of Shark Tank. Better than I would have done, I'm out. Okay. Thank you, Mark. In a movie that pays wild attention to details, Alpha is a company built on shaky ground. Miles even poorly replicated its original design when he powerbombed the narrative and used his reality distortion field to subjugate his friends and suck whatever life out of them they had left. He is a vainglorious dictator, a murderous leech, the last one standing on a ship that was already sinking. The middle of the onion, the thing in plain sight for the entire film. Alpha isn't real, it's just the same old modern era snake oil. This dipshit backstabbed their own friend over crypto fund management. It's literally Sam Bakeman free, just more murder. <laughs> What's in the center of the onion? A warning. Stop following rich idiots, they'll get you killed. Miles stole a bad idea, he killed Sandra for a bad idea. Bad ideas jockeying for space in the mind of a fool, the infraction point. Miles' idea of building a better world is predicated on breaking the old one. I think disruptors recognize each other. No, no, yes. you, you, you've used that word before, disruptors. What does that mean? Well, innovation is not breaking stuff just to break it. Being a disruptor means nothing and it should be treated as such. No amount of clue or flashy costumes or brilliant world changing photography will alter what is clear and apparent at the center of the onion. This is a story of revenge, a tale of noir and pain. There was no miracle cure, the emperor is not wearing clothes, here's a slice of life in our current ruined reality. A detective helps a woman he just met take down one of the most powerful people in the world. Though Miles does a lot of the heavy lifting himself, installing the failsafe to ensure that you could destroy the most famous painting in the world. Priceless. It's all for nothing. A brazen stockpiling of art he was told is good. A movie that shows you, tells you, and then rubs your face in the fact that all of these people, the politician, the men's rights activists, the corporate scientists, the movie star, they're all full of shit. And all of these people will do absolutely anything to stay on top. But maybe the Beatles were right. Gosh, maybe we do kind of overthink it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>